okay, now let me, let me, uh, group this particularly this break here, and try to give you a contrast of what we've got into the way that happened. Uh, it's in mind, uh, where we're going. Uh, last time we began a theological definition of preaching, which we said involved five basic aspects. And we begin the uh, first aspect, which has to do with divine activity, which is the basic inspiration behind preaching. Um, we are now in the midst of the Word of God, which is the basic content for the will of God. If you understand what the will of God is, if you understand what these five things mean, then you have a God pretty good. We dealt with the first aspect, which is where we said it was not the Bible, but Emmanuel, and he God with us. Now we're coming to a to um, items two and three under what the will of God or the content or the word of God means, which will be gospel and grace. On Friday we will continue with the last two aspects of this fivefold meaning of the word of God, which is truth in Jesus Christ. And we will go on to deal with these other aspects for the next three days. The basic agency, which is proclaimed or announced, contemporary issues, the basic context in which our teaching must take place, and the response to God, which is the ultimate basic objective of our faith. There you go. Now let us move to item C on our lecture outline, page 3. To get at another meaning of the Word of God, or the will of God, or the content, so it must be in all genuine preaching. There we go. Okay. Now, if we said that the first meaning of the Word of God is not the Bible, but is really the being of God Himself as Emmanuel in the preached Word, then this question can be raised. What specifically? Does God Himself mean <laughs> as the content of the declared word? In other words, what are the implications of presenting God Himself in preaching? Jesse, on me. On me, Jesse. You want to come to that you want no meaning unless I can get it from me. So on me now. Now, the answer to that question leads us to declare. Four other divine meanings involved in the Word of God in preaching. And if you never got these five uh, elements, you ain't preaching the Word of God. You know, you preach the Word of man, the Word of God. And the second divine meaning that we will declare about the proclaimed Word of God is that it means gospel. The Word of God as gospel being proclaimed in the divine activity. Of preaching. Now, what do we mean by the word gospel being proclaimed? And where were you stuck now? Hey, Jesse, you ain't got the right line. I know you ain't got that. So come on, get that. That's why you're coming around here. Come on, get that, Jesse. You ain't got that. Come on, get yours. What do we mean by the word of God, the gospel being proclaimed in preaching? Well, if we look at the term gospel literally, we find that the term gospel is literally composed of an elision of two Anglo-Saxon terms, God and Spain. Huh? You see that? All right, do you see that? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. Now, an elision is where the letters of the original words drop out. Of two or more uh, original words drop out to form a single word. It might be funny, but it's going to be in the case. I didn't say that. Such as can't, or cannot, two of the letters drop out, don't, or do not, ain't, am not, homiletics, or homily rhetoric. These terms are combined into one term, and some of the letters drop out, and that is what you mean by an elision. And we're saying that the word gospel is an elision of God and spell. Huh? And if you if you pronounce these two words together fast, 
you'll find that it almost sounds like gut gut tail, gut tail, gut tail, gut tail, gut tail. See, see what it's saying? And the D drops out, and the last L drops out, you have an illusion, which is gospel. But it's a combination of two terms, God and Sam. Huh? Okay. So putting these two Anglo-Saxon words together, we come up with this meaning of the term gospel, literally. Meaning a spell, or a season, or a period of time, when God himself is with us. Emmanuel. And thus, preaching God's word as gospel would mean a spell or a season or a period of time when God's presence is being dynamically proclaimed. Yes? Well, then, what does a spell or a season or a period of time of God's presence being dynamically proclaimed mean to us and for us specifically? Why is it I know? to us and for us to deliver and to receive the gospel. Well, it is simply this, that when God himself comes to be with us for a spell or a season or a period of time in dynamic preached gospel, he always brings with him good news. Huh? That's a synonym for God. Good news. Huh? Yeah. And we do indeed desperately need some good news. Yes. <laughs> After all of the bad news we've been having in our time. Yes. Riding in the streets. Crime on the increase. Mounting tides of racism. Tangled up in a war we can't get out of nor in. And idiots everywhere bellowing like hell. <laughs> Yes, indeedy, we do desperately need some good news. In the midst of all this bad news we've been hearing about lately. Now, is this not the meaning of God in human experience? Gospel? God with us for a spell or a season or a period of time, meaning good news? Is that what God means? Things changing for the better. Like dawning in the midst of darkness and fears. Isn't it not also why we sing that song, Good news, the chariot's coming? Mm -hmm. Why? Well, we know that nothing less than God Himself is in that chariot on the way, and that things will be brighter and better when God gets there. Yeah. For God's presence always brings something wonderful and miraculous and beneficial to us and for us in his appearing. A divine benediction in God's presence always. It's like daddy coming home from town with some candy. Good news for his kids. Gospel. For example, is this not uh, the good news that Isaiah was meaning when he said, Behold how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the prophets who publish peace, who bring glad tidings of great joy, who say unto Zion, Behold your God! Meaning, here he is! In the proclamation of the word. Yes, indeed, it was always good news for those folk to see the feet of a genuine prophet in that pulpit. <laughs> Every now and then, after all the nasty feet of jack legs they had to put up with week after week, and experienced God's presence for a long, long time with all them jack legs whining and moaning and switching them around in that pulpit. So, a little one of them, that when a real prophet came along every now and then, those folk would break forth into this hymn of preparation for the sermon. O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, get thee up into that pulpit and say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Meaning, preach the gospel. Good news. 
So not needing something like that at our annual conference six years ago. Some real God. Some real good news in the midst of all that trash going around at our annual conference six years ago. Now again, for example, it is not also the reason why Jesus Christ himself went upon, went upon the mountain after seeing the multitude. And when he was set up there on the mountain, Jesus proclaimed what? Blessed are you. Huh? Not proclaiming there shall be blessings later on, but proclaiming blessed are you already and perfectly now. For Jesus knew that the being of God himself was already and perfectly in their midst on that very mountain in him. Emmanuel, God with us, a blessing present, good news there, a heavenly benediction, gospel in their midst, all that mountain top in the very being of the Christ of God speaking to them. Jesus was saying, so to speak, blessed are you, for I is here, gospel, good news in me, present with you and speaking to you. I remember taking a course in New Testament at Union Theological Seminary one summer, summer under Marcus Park, the son of that great theologian, Karl Barth. And he interpreted the, the, the word blessed in the Beatitudes to mean congratulations. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> and as a bark, I finished exegeting each one of those Beatitudes, Marcus Bart would say, Congratulations to those who are poor in spirit. For you are going to heaven, and so on. For each one of the Beatitudes. So we know that when he got to exegeting, uh, Beatitude 1 and Beatitude 2, he will say, Congratulations! Huh? Which means the same thing as that. Well, I'm sure that Margaret Bart was right in using that word, congratulations. For Jesus was indeed saying to those folk, in essence, congratulations, you lucky folks, for being privileged to lay your beady eyes on me. You bums, show sure enough is lucky to see what you see. Congratulations. Hmm? Well now, <coughs> were those bones the last ones to be lucky enough to see something worthwhile? Huh? No, no, huh? No. Well, without boasting or complaining, but merely stating a fact, let me say to you, congratulations, <laughs> you lucky bones, yeah. uh -huh. for being privileged to get your bunkum bunkums into this class. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Right. Thank you. Just take my time. You showed up in lucky! Yeah! yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of you don't even know it. Some don't even know it. Some don't even know it. Blessings here too. Because you ain't dealing with no chat lady. But you are right as a person, but you don't chat lady for you. <laughs> but back to the subject, back to the subject. Now. And we are saying that the preached word as gospel always means a season or a spell or a period of time when our Heavenly Father is present very dynamically with us. Our being in the presence of Him who is always wonderful, counselor, the mighty God. Yes. The everlasting Father, yes, the Prince yes. of Peace. Yes. yes, indeed, God's presence always does mean peace. Yes. For it means that the threat of George Wallace yes. and Lester Maddox yes. and Sparrow Agnew yes. and Tricky Dicky Nixon is over. Yes. For then our God is going to take over when he gets here. Yeah. And the government, the government, the government will be upon God's shoulders. Oh, yeah. Remember that song? And God Himself and God alone 
shall reign over us and in us and through us forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever. Hallelujah! 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 Yes, God Almighty, no more crazy lessons. And no more tricky dick, dicky. To reign over us then. That would be good news. Real gospel to our ears. And that is exactly the ultimate meaning of the preached word. The sure guarantee that God himself will eventually take over. And run things with grace and truth in human experience. So preaching then is divine activity where in the word of God as gospel mm -hmm. is proclaimed or announced of the temporary issues that they deal with ultimately respond to our God. So let's check this one off. Let's see with that. Let us begin our third consideration of the meaning of the Word of God by raising this question. What is the essence of the good news or gospel that the proclaimed Word brings to us? What specifically makes the gospel a blessing to us and for us? Well, in order to respond to that question, we will follow the lead of St. John in the prologue to his gospel, where St. John says, And the Word became flesh, meaning in Jesus Christ, in his birth. And he goes on further to say, specifically what the divine word in Jesus Christ, in history, means when St. John says this, full of grace and full of truth. Huh? So now you see what the next three go be Let us consider then, in the third place, the meaning of the word of God as grace. Full, overflowing with grace, St. John says about the divine incarnate word. So the question here is this. What do we mean by the proclaimed word being full and overflowing with grace? Huh? Let us look at the meaning and implications of the term grace. Now, literally, the term grace means a condition wherein a, an inferior receives something from his superior as a pure favor. The servant receiving something from his Lord, which the servant has no right to or claim to. That's all you see. It would be like the boss permitting his chauffeur to use the boss's Cadillac to go on a personal day. Huh? Or like a teacher giving his students a semester grade on the basis of the best three or four of your test notes. Certainly is. For neither the chauffeur nor those students have any rights or claims to those things. Yeah. No, sir, you don't. And those who act like you do. For well, those things are the bestowal of a pure favor. Not on the basis of the merit of the recipients, but solely on the basis of the goodness of the giver. Thus, literally speaking, the term grace means an out and out gift. Literally meaning a free gift <coughs> with no strings attached. A pure favor. A boon. Now, historically speaking, the idea behind the meaning of the term grace comes down to us from the days of the kings of old. That's where it comes from. For the basic idea of a kingdom was that the king was the sole owner of all things and all persons in his kingdom. 
the king alone, owning all things. And all persons ultimately on the basis of the divine rights of kings under God. That was a doctrine. A theological doctrine. For God himself had bestowed upon the king the stewardship and the protection of everything and every person in the king's domain. In the same way that we think of a bishop's divine authority. Well, yeah. And if you're a Baptist, a pastor's well, divine authority. Right. Yeah. Well, you know we know about that, don't yeah. 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 Divine right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? That's right. Well, the king had that too. So if the king shall dispose to give to anyone anything, it will consider purely and solely an act of grace on the king's part. Well, the king did not have to do it. Yeah. It was an out and out free gift. A pure faith. A king's boon. Grace for the king under God, historically speaking. For instance, this idea of a pure favor is behind the Spanish term gracias. Gracias, which looks like the word grace in English. Then. All right. Yeah. Uh, gracias in Spanish meaning thanks for a freely bestowed favor upon me, Senor. Gracias, Senor. Thank you, Mister, from the bottom of my heart for this free gift. It's what the Spanish mean when they say gracias. Senor. Now, theologically speaking, the idea of the graciousness of God's grace becomes more acutely apparent. You ain't heard nothing about gracias until you look at it theologically. Yes, you did. Well, we cannot think of the graciousness of God's grace without contrasting divine grace with human sin. Huh? You don't want to see how white something is, or what a person is. Put it beside a black man. Don't see how black a person is? Put it beside a white man. Only really see what the white is doing for the black man. So we're contrasting the, the peculiarity of divine grace and over again the reality of the individual. And it's because of this necessary connection between divine grace and human sin. That our preaching is absolutely urgent, urgent, and serious. Because all genuine preaching presupposes and wrestles with the scandal of human sin. So ain't no sense and no monkey here thinking he can ever climb up into that pulpit for lazily thinking that he can preach a genuine sermon without reference to that basic presupposition of all preaching. Namely, human sin. Even when we're preaching of the greatest and the mostest, Christian love, it is still understood best in the light of the scandal of human sin. We can never make sense out of the positive in preaching without reference to that scandalous negative. Human sin. Even the first place. Need no preacher if it wasn't for human sin. Well, then, what is it about human sin that makes it a necessary for presupposition for all genuine preaching? Well, to get at the full meaning of human sin would take us far beyond the bounds of the scope. In fact, the full scope of the 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 and implications of that big scandal in human experience within the confines of this two-hour course in preaching. Not fully, at least. But, we can and must say a few things about this ever-present scandal in all of human history, including your personal history and my <coughs> personal history. 
That scandal is there in you and in me, whether we like it or not. And whether we face it or not. And unless we do face it and understand it for the nasty fact that it is, we will never preach a sermon on the graciousness of God's grace with power to save. Now, one thing that we can say is that sin in principle, you see that? <laughs> see that? Sin in principle always means rebellion. It ain't no mistake. It's a rebellion. You know what? Rebellion. You go and talk about I made a mistake. When you try to, try to uh, get forgiveness and forget for yourself, it ain't no mistake. It's rebellion. Well, against the fundamental principles of our lives. You talk about, uh, talk about sin being like, like some mistake, or like, uh, like, uh, when, uh, when some woman and, 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 and a man have a child out of wedlock. There ain't no mistake either. There ain't no mistake either. That's a sin. No mistake. No mistake. No, no mistake. If you deliberately chose to go behind the building and deliberately put yourself in positions where you couldn't help yourself, it's a choice. Free choice. So you gave up your power and went behind the building and got yourself hot. Ain't no mistake. It's a sin. <laughs> it's always rebellion against the fundamental principle of our lives, namely rebellion against God Himself, our fundamental creator and benefactor in life. Always basically against God. As David put it so eloquently in his heartfelt repentance about stealing another man's wife and then deliberately sending that man to the front to be surely killed in battle, David said this about his own scandalous sin. It was not against Uriah. It was, saying, it was not against Uriah. But I have said, but against God, who gave to us Uriah. Huh? And against sin only. All sin is ultimately against God. The foundation of life. <laughs> For sin in principle is always against the source and ground of our being. In other words, sin in principle is like uh, defying orders from headquarters. Meaning that the subject refuses to obey the king's orders. <laughs> But the subject commits treason and endeavors to take over in the kingdom so that he, the subject, can run things his own way in defiance of the king. Again, sin in principle is like the naughty child who eats by the sweat of his father's brow, but who gets mad and curses his daddy out and slaps his daddy free. Just because his father asked him to save some supper for the rest of the family, not there at supper time. That naughty kid is determined then to eat up everything but the tablecloth. <laughs> In defiance of both his mother and father who provided that table for the welfare of the whole family and not that dog alone. <laughs> for sin in principle always means rebellion. Against basic authority. Sin is at the basis of much of his revolution, but it's never the rebellion against basic authority. You've got to have some authority. And you're going to have some authority in this whether you like it or not. Whether you rebel or not, you're going to have some authority. Always mean rebellion against basic authority for the welfare of all concerned. Now, characteristically speaking, you see that? See where we are now? Sin always involves deliberate self-deception about our low-down, guilty, rebellious activity against the fundamental principle of life. Not a rebellion, but you're going to lie about it. Huh? 
In other words, the sinner always tries to fool himself into believing that he didn't do it. And that he ain't doing it. For no man, no living human, no man can betray his best friend and then live comfortably, comfortably with that thought. So the way we sinful rascals try to live with our sinful crime is by deceiving ourselves about it. Literally pulling the wool over our own eyes, eyes with a web of self-deceiving, rationalizing lies. We begin to live out our days on the basis of self-deceiving, self-concocted fantasies. Just so that we can live with our guilty self. For every, I know it is. For every sinner has to figure out some way to live with his ever present sinful guilty self. He must find some way to face that beast each morning in the mirror. Must learn how to tolerate that beast that tags along with him all day long and that crawls into bed with him at night to plague him in his sleep. That beastly being must be lived with in some way. And thus as sinners, we must make up all kinds of self-deceiving lies to make that beast seem to be decent enough and respectable enough to live with. And we endeavor to soothe our guilt-ridden consciences with these kinds of lying fabrications, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, lies like these. If that snake well, that hadn't forced me to do it, 